Blessings, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the channel today. Hope you're doing well wherever you may find yourselves. I'm Dane, your host of the Rocky Metal Guardian. We all have our favorite bands, don't we? Of course we do. And within the confines of those said favorite bands, we often gravitate towards one of those members more than others because they're our favorite. So there's a favorite within the favorite, right? Because there's something special about them. Not to take away from the other members, though. And just something about this particular person resonates with us more than the other members. Uh, we connect with them more, right? And they, they pull at our emotions and we give in to those emotions, right? More than the others. They're the glue often that holds the band together. And in some rare instances, maybe not so rare, they may carry the band. Um, so today's episode is entitled Special Sauce musicians whose departures or whose change in style left a void in said band. Um, and so, as you'll see today, this does not mean that when this person leaves the band that I don't like the band anymore, it's just that it's never the same again. Uh, hence the metaphor. So, I like to cook and I like to make my own sauces. So here's a sauce. And this is one of my special sauces, the ingredients are only known to me. And what's in here, there are three ingredients, is quite good. However, it's missing one final ingredient, and it's this one. And while without this, this is pretty darn good. But with this, it's superb. This is good, this is superb. So that's the metaphor. So we're talking about someone leaves the band or they change their style, and you have this instead of this with this in it, the special ingredient. Now, in some cases, these will be duos, and one might be more special than the other, as you'll see, but it's really, this is really good. I don't have this, and now I've taken something else out. Now I only have two of the four ingredients, so definitely never the same. So let's go ahead and get started. The first musician is Ace Freely. Once he leaves Kiss, the, the writing was on the wall, especially for me. You know, I thought he was on Creatures of the night, and then lo and behold, I learned, I don't know, a year or two later that he wasn't. So disappointing, you know, his face is on the cover. Same thing with Peter, we learned later that he's not on Unmasked and he's not, or he's barely on Dynasty kind of thing. So, but let's stick to Peter, I'm sorry, let's stick to Ace for right now. So Ace leaves the band because he did not like where the band was going with respect to both Unmasked and definitely The Elder. The Elder is where he's trying to convince the band, as you know, hey, we gotta return to that what made us special, and they didn't. Bob Ezrin was partly to blame for that. And of course, Paul Stanley now admits that that was a blunder. And then you get into um, eventually the comeback album with Creatures of the Night, but as I said, Ace is not on it. And everything after that is, is, is a hair metal, very commercial. Some of it's good, some of it's just awful. Most of that catalog I would say once you get into Animal Eyes, I, I'm not enjoying much at all. Maybe two songs, yeah, two songs on Asylum, and that's pretty much where. That's pretty much it. I don't even like much of what's on Revenge. So I know. So Ace Frehley's our first member. What could have been is kind of the tie and connection to that. Imagine a Kiss in a parallel universe, right, where Ace Frehley's still in the band, and you have more of the deuce and the strutter and the cold gin and the parasite not the exact same songs of course but in that vein right that and so let's jump in now to peter chris peter chris also was special to me um so peter chris he had that great raspiness to his voice i love the peter chris songs um baby driver black diamond there's just so many well they're not many but there's a good bit from, from Peter where he has the lead vocals. That, that's kind of why I was attracted to Kiss in, in the first place early on, because you get all four vocals. Ace comes last in that mix with respect to singing. He had to get his confidence and all that. But just something, when you when you hear Black Diamond, when you hear Let Me Go Rock and Roll, and, and, and some of the uh, hooligan, right? The, to me, it's magic. So kind of a duo here, but, but, but Ace was really more so the glue than, than Peter. All right, next is definitely a duo. Let's talk about the guitarist first, and I'm talking about Chris DeGarmo. I, no resentment towards him for leaving the band because he wanted to, 
pursue becoming um, a licensed um, pilot. Um, but once he leaves the band, it, it's never the same. And of course, here, here in the Now Frontier, you can see the writing on the wall again. And, and that, that's not a very good album. I, I had it for the longest time and then I ended up giving it to a friend. I never listened to it anymore. It has its moments, but not enough. And so perhaps DeGarmo's heart wasn't in it. You, at least I hear it. Um, and so the duo here is Jeff Tate. Once Jeff Tate leaves as well, it's clearly not the same, right? But having said that, between the two, DeGarmo was more of the glue than Jeff because imagine if you had Chris DeGarmo in the band right now with the current lineup. I think it would be better because, oh man, I can't remember the singer now. Um, Todd Latour, um, great voice, right? There's just something missing and I think it's Chris. Um, Kelly Gray was pretty cool as, as, as a guitar player, but never the same. I saw them six times and the three times I saw him with Chris DeGarmo live was much better than the times that I saw them without him. So, and again, no, no disrespect. It's just, he was the special glue here for me. And, and let's face it, Jeff Tate, at a certain point, he, he's the one with respect more like with the change in style, right? Chris DeGarmo's the departure part of this uh, episode and then Jeff Tate's the change in style. He was trying to shed that heavy metal stuff. He got tired of that and that's what us fans want. That's what the band really wanted still or most of them. So there you have it for as far as Queensryche goes. Next, a lot of people will agree, will agree with this one, Richie Blackmore. When he leaves Deep Purple, it's, it's, I'm pretty much out. Of course you get to come back with Perfect Strangers, right? All on board. Then you get uh, House of Blue Light, like one song, Bad Attitude, and it's the fighting between him and Ian Gillen that really, you know, can you hear on the record? No, but, well, I guess you can and you can't, depends. There just, there's that, again, what I mean by that is that Richie's heart is not in it because he's not able to do what he wants because perhaps because he's fighting with other band members, especially Ian Gillen. So, and it's, it's no disrespect to either band member. Um, I'm not taking sides here as I won't at all, but it's just once Richie leaves, for me, it was never the same with the exception of, um, I do like Tommy Bolin on Come Taste the Band. However, after that, that was it. Um, I'm not a big fan of, um, all the back half of the catalog. Um, so anyway, the guitar player who, who was in Kansas, uh, Steve Morse. So I just, I like Steve Morse in Kansas, but I never thought he was a big fit, a good fit for um, Deep Purple. So Richie Blackmore for me definitely was that special magical favorite of mine when it came to Deep Purple. All right, next is K.K. Downing of Judas Priest. Hey, I love Glenn Tipton's uh, style and tone and technique and virtuosity and all that. But for whatever reason, ever since I became a Judas Priest fan, it was always K.K. Downing that I looked forward to um, when I would go see them live to hear him and see him take the lead. Um, just something for me personally more magical than him. Tipton's here, well, Tipton's here, I'm sorry. Tipton's here, but for me, K.K.'s right here. So a little bit more magical or a touch more magical, right? To me, to these ears. Okay, so next is an example of where a, with a band, Lightning struck twice with their lead singers, and this doesn't happen very often, and then once they leave, the magic dies. So Black Sabbath, Ozzy. And again, we see the writing on the wall with Never Say Die and the album before that, Technical Ecstasy, right? Pales, those two albums with Ozzy pale in comparison to everything that came before, okay? Ozzy's dad dies. Um, hence the song Junior's Eyes. Um, he, he's he's really succumbing to his addiction problems, his alcoholism, right? Excuse me. And so for me, Sabotage was the last great Ozzy album with him in the band. And, and despite the fact that Ozzy isn't the best singer in the world, there was just something charismatic and charming uh, to the band. A lot of people call Ozzy the weakest link. Uh, not for me. Um, Iomi would be a close second, right? 
again. So anyway, so Ozzy leaves, Dio comes in. So the magic isn't gone yet, it's just different. And the magic works, okay? Dio then leaves, fighting with Iomi, supposedly about the mix in live evil. Who knows what the real story is? But regardless, Dio leaves after two albums. He comes back for Dehumanizer, doesn't stay, comes back again for Heaven and Hell, and then he passes away. Now, Dio goes solo, of course, but once you get into the Tony Martin era, for me, the chemistry's gone, nothing ever the same again for me. So this one's a little different from the rest that I'm presenting because Ozzy leaves and the magic isn't gone. It's just a different magic. Would we have wanted a, a longer run with Ozzy? Of course, just like we would, would have wanted a longer run with Dio. All right, next is Dio himself. I mentioned Black Sabbath. He leaves Rainbow after three albums. And for me, um, I like Jill and Turner, but I prefer Dio more. And then um, the album, Down to Earth, never been a big fan. I love Cozy Powell's drums on it and a couple things here and there. But overall, it's Blackmore's turn to succumb to wanting to go really commercial. And that's, that's also tied to, if we talk about Blackmore and Rainbow, that's where he changes his style. But for me, it was the Dio factor that was the glue my favorite in that band. All right, next is Randy Rhodes. And this, of course, is not to be insensitive. It's just a plain shame and a, and, and a darn fact, an unfortunate fact that for me personally, Randy Rhodes, Randy Rhodes was, was what made Ozzy's solo career special, or if we call it Blizzard of Oz, right? So next is David Byron and Gary Thane of Uriah Heep. David Byron leaves because of his alcoholism, see a theme here, and Gary Thane leaves because he passes away. Um, I think from cancer, from smoking, don't quote me on that. But these these were my two favorite members of the band. Um, so once they're gone, yes, I liked a lot in era, but it was never the same. All right, Brian Connolly of Sweet. You get, I got, I remember when I got a copy of Cut Above the Rest, Brian's out of the band. I had no idea um, that Brian Connolly left the band because someone punched him in the throat in a bar fight and he could never really sing again after that the way he wanted to. So he's out on his ass, unfortunately. And uh, Steve Priest steps in on vocals and he sounds a lot like Brian Connolly in the, in the same manner that um, Phil Collins sounds a lot like Peter Gabriel, but not the same, same way that Elefante sounds a little bit like um, Steve Walsh, although I listen to it now, not so much, but back then I could hear that that similarity, not so much anymore. So Connolly is sidelined, and then you get way too pop-oriented stuff with um, Sweet, and so after that I was out. Um, there's some okay tracks after that and the three albums after that, but never the same. Next is one of my favorite guitar tones of all time. I'm talking about Pete Willis of Def Leppard. He, of course, again, he leaves the band. Same thing with Chris DeGarmo. I can't blame him for leaving. He had to clean himself up, get his life together, succumbing to alcoholism. Um, it's too bad he couldn't come back though, but I get that. But there was nothing like that high and dry album when it comes to Def Leppard's whole catalog. It had crunch and it had heaviness. You have a, you know, you have a power ballad with the, bringing all the heartbreak, but there was some heaviness to it. It made me, when I was 14 and 15, when that stuff was out and new and fresh, I thought to myself, this, this could be what, this could be like, this is like a, this is kind of like Led Zeppelin to me, in, in a way. Anyway, so I thought they might be uh, the next Led Zeppelin, and not literally, but sort of, uh, just overall with the, the heaviness that Zeppelin had. It, was, it had something to do with Willis's guitar tone, very Jimmy Page-esque in ways, not totally, but in ways. All right, next, Michael Schenker. When he leaves U UFO, and then you get Paul Tonka Chapman. I love Paul Tonka Chapman, but he pales in comparison to the great Michael Schenker. Um, I like No Place to Run. That is a fabulous album. And then you get Wild Willing and the Innocent. You get Mechanics and um, oh, the one with the woman on the album cover with her, you know, octopus arms, uh, Making Contact. Um, that's a, those are really good albums. They're not fantastic. They're not great. They're very good or good. They're not great. They're not legendary. They're not masterpieces. Uh, no place to run is, is I think this close to being um, a masterpiece. But so again, no disrespect to Paul Chapman, uh, 
but Michael Shanker for me was where it's at. All right, Jeff Hanneman of Slayer. I know Kerry King's the um, the big one everyone gravitates to, but for me it was Jeff. Uh, and if we're gonna call this a duo, I would go with the original drummer, and his name will lose me as I speak. But anyway, next, also a duo, but of the two, Dave Mustaine was the glue in this band in Metallica. And if you look at the first two albums and listen to the first two albums, you look at the liner notes, you see that Mustaine uh, co-wrote and wrote a lot of that early material that finds its way in those two albums. Remember his biography, he told the band, don't use my songs, they use them anyway. Kind of glad they did, but if you think about it, Metallica, even though Mustaine doesn't play on those two albums, it is some of his music. You can think of it as Metallica slash Mustaine in a way I do. They're not pure Metallica albums from that standpoint because they're using someone, part, using part, parts of someone else's um, material. And of course, um, um, I'm sorry, uh, Kirk Hammett comes in to replace Dave Mustaine. And if we talk about duos, of course, I truly believe, and of course there's no way to prove this, but I believe in my heart of hearts that if had Cliff Burton lived and not died in Sweden or Norway um, in the bus accident, the band would have stayed true to their roots at least a little longer, and they would have been, they would have been heavier. They would have had that punch. Um, but anyway, so Cliff Burton and Dave Mustaine, but Dave Mustaine, to me personally, was my favorite member of Metallica. All right, next. Speaking of Megadeth, Marty Friedman. Um, once he leaves, you get, well, you get Rust in Peace, you get Countdown to Extinction, you get Euthanasia, maybe one more, and, and that's it. This is a fabulous period. I love the first four albums before he steps in. They're, they're a fact, kind of like Metallica's first four albums were their best, and they are, but there's something, oh, well, Marty Friedman's on the fourth one. So, but after that, once he leaves, it, it's never the same. You have this rotating number of band members coming in and out. There's some good stuff there. Some of it close to great, but just not the same without Marty. All right, Peter Frampton. There's something to be said about wanting to go solo. I have a theory, maybe this is a video down the road. I think if you look at the data, if you look at the evidence, most solo careers are not successful, despite what sales may say, but that's a video down the road. Um, Peter Frampton is successful, but once you get I Mean You, pretty much after that, no one's caring. And he himself said he should not have allowed himself to make him look like a, um, a poster boy for the ladies, you know, the album cover and all that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the, you know, the Leaf Garrett thing, right? Whatever that term is called. Anyway, so Peter Frampton leaves Humble Pie and Humble Pie was never the same. I like Clem Clemson, but it was never the same. And I remember reading a few years ago that had, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost my train of thought with um, Steve Marriott. Had he not died in, in his house fire from the cigarette that killed him, um, Frampton was wanting to reunite with his buddy there. Anyway, so what could have been right? Keith Moon of The Who. Even Roger Daltrey himself said in his biography that came out right around COVID, give or take, said in that, I read that, I got that as a Christmas present or a birthday present. It's very good. Um, normally I wouldn't have read it, but I did read it. Um, sometimes I get biographies for Christmas or birthday and I'm like, hey, I'm not gonna read this, but I read this one um, and I'm glad that I did. But Daltrey himself said that he never thought Kenny Jones was a good fit and I totally agree. All right, Eddie Van Halen. Now Eddie Van Halen has often been referred to as a gearhead. And I think this is this is more of the um, change in direction with the keyboards in 1984. And instead of having a heavy guitar intro going to a song, you have a into a song you have the keyboards, you know, with jump and all that. It's just never the same after that. Uh, so this is a case of where the artist who was the glue that held the band together, uh, maybe a duo. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, steps on his own feet, is in his own way, and that's why too much gear getting in the way of your signature sound. So speaking of duo, never the same with David Lee, once David Lee, excuse me, once David Lee Roth leaves, so maybe consider this one, but Eddie's my favorite of the two. 
Um, I actually <laughs> I like the other two members. I like the other. I like everyone in that band better than David Lee Roth. But you have to give it to him. Like Ozzy, he had that charisma. But again, David Lee Roth is like Eddie in the sense that he stepped on his own feet and 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 hurt the band because he's more interested in the flash and the sizzle instead of the steak or the substance, right? With all the karate moves and the sword and the scarves and the dancing and the vaudeville. You know, it's kind of like Dennis DeYoung with the sticks, with, with sticks with the vaudeville. So very similar in, in how Eddie Van Halen and David Lee Roth got in their own way. All right, uh, Jim Morrison. I remember, I, I never knew for the longest time that there were two albums after he died. I thought they just broke up. No, they have two albums. They're dreadful. And I'll stop there, just leave it at that. You should have stopped with Morrison's um, death. I thought that was, here's a case where it's insulting to, to continue. All right, Roger Waters. Yes, The Wall arguably is really a solo album with the band brought on board as hired pay. And the same thing is true of definitely with um, the final cut and I like the final cut but it pales a comparison to the wall um, so way way pales a comparison there are moments that I like maybe half of it so Roger Waters leaving the band uh, I'm not on board with the division bell and and all that just never I saw them live without Roger and it was good wasn't great um, not exactly memorable I have the pulse you know, CD, which is essentially the same set list, if I'm not mistaken. It's okay. All right, Brian May of Queen. Here's somebody who's, who stopped their, the, the, the style that we know and love, right? We wanted that, we want that technique with the, the heaviness and the heft, and there's some of that, but very little compared to that early catalog. Next is Sammy Hager. And this is another duo, perhaps. Sammy Hager, Ronnie Montrose. It was Ronnie. It's about like Van Halen and David Lee Roth getting in his own way, stepping on his own feet kind of thing because he's perhaps jealous of Sammy's singing voice, Sammy's guitar virtuosity. But there's nothing to be jealous of. Montrose was an excellent guitar player, an equal with Sammy, maybe to some degree even slightly better. But his jealousy perhaps is what got in the way. He wanted to sing more on Paper Money. He wanted to take the lead more or sh or be more involved in the guitar and, and not have Sammy do as much. Sammy leaves, he's fed up. Sammy is one of those who does have a successful career. Um, sales or no sales, there's good sales, right? Anyway, so Ronnie Montrose and Sammy Hager. Montrose was never the same after the first album, Paper Money is pales in comparison to that because Ronnie's stepping on his own two feet. All right, next is Ian Hunter of Moth the Hoople. So, Ian Hunter leaves to go solo. You have a wonder, here's another wonderful solo career up until he starts sounding too much like Bob Dylan, but he leaves, Moth the Hoople becomes a Mott. Okay, then later on Mott breaks up and then you have British Lions. So, Moth the Hoople's up here. Mott is here, and British Lions is way down here, in my estimation. Now, there is a song, I should have pulled it out. I like Drive On, and I like Shining and Pointing. They're not great, but there's some likable songs there. There's actually one song on Shining and Pointing, I can't remember the name of it, that, oh my God, it sounds like it was made and created for Ian. Because the singer, I can't remember his name, he sounds like he's making his best effort to imitate Ian. I don't know if it's not on purpose, but this song sounds like, and this is, this is one of their, my favorite songs by them, again, don't remember the name of it. It's just eluding me right now, but it's fabulous. Anyway, um, there's no, it's, the lyrics are, there's no such thing as rock, there's no such thing as rock and roll. So oh, it's, it's beautiful, it's a piano, and it, oh, it's great. Anyway, so Ian Hunter. Next is Vivian Campbell. He leaves Dio's band after Sacred Heart or during Sacred Heart. And again, we all know the story or most of us do. He's upset with Ronnie. Ronnie promised him that Vivian would get paid better. Ronnie reneges on his promise. Uh, I remember years ago seeing a YouTube video where someone captures on tape or film or phone um, Ronnie going ape, you know what, over 
the fact that uh, Vivian left and he's calling he's calling Vivian all kinds of horrible names at while he's at the table signing autographs clearly upset um, and I know I'm signing I'm not signing anyone but um, Vivian leaves and let's face it like some of the things I mentioned already you can hear on Sacred Heart that Vivian's heart wasn't it there's no half there's no heaviness it's too commercial all that right so Vivian Campbell John Wetton I'm talking about King Crimson not family not the other bands not Uriah Heep but King Crimson so you have the Holy Trinity oh, sorry you have the Holy Trinity of King Crimson albums with Lark's Tongues and Aspic Starless and Bible Black and Red these are fabulous start to finish all good now for whatever reason, Fripp loves to break up the band and bring back a new new iteration. Um, and so I, I remember getting Discipline and then Beat and then two of a perfect pair, three of a perfect pair, excuse me. That last one of those three is the best one of the three. It's got Lark's Tongues and Asterix part, part four. Okay, I'm in. It's a good, a good, if not great song. There's some okay stuff there. But, and there's a couple songs I like on Discipline. I almost never listen to Beat. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, just too different. So this is Someone Leaves and there's a change in signature sound. So John Wetton, the crunchy bass, the, 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 the fuzzy bass, excuse me, and his, 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 his lovely singing voice. So speaking about voice, let me go back to Chris DeGarmo for a minute because I failed to mention this. With Chris DeGarmo, what was special about Chris DeGarmo, I don't think I mentioned this, so if I'm repeating myself, sorry, was his ability with his, with his vocals. He worked so wonderful with Jeff Tate in that harmony. And so once he's out, I'm pretty much out. So back to John Wetton, same thing, his voice. Lovely singing voice, right? Very akin to Greg Lake. Of the two, I like John Wetton John Witten a bit more. Uh, there's a version of him where he sings... Um, uh, Firth of Fifth by Genesis. He's touring with Steve Hackett, and he does a verse. This was like I think a couple years before he died, or right before he died. Wow, it's amazing. So John Wetton, great vocalist, great bass player, never the same after he leaves. Next is Mick Taylor, The Rolling Stones. No disrespect to um, Brian Jones, but Mick Taylor is my favorite guitar player for the for the Stones, and that's when they have their best run. If you include. Beggar's Banquet, which has Jones on it, right? So everything from Beggar's Banquet through and including um, It's Only Rock and Roll. That's my favorite run from the Stones. Why? With the exception of that first album, Mick Taylor. Okay, he was in um, John May on the Blues, Blues Breakers, right? It's a wonderful song, Driving Sideways, which is amazing. Uh, just a great guitar, virtu virtuosity. No offense to, to Woody but Ron Wood, very simplistic type guitar player, um, too much like um, his counterpart in the band, uh, Keith Richards. So Mick Taylor brought a flavor to the band that you could not taste once he left. All right, Peter Green of Fleetwood Mac. So you could call this a holy trinity. You have Peter Green, um, Danny Kerwin, and Jeremy Spencer, but of those three, Peter Green's my favorite. He decides to, to quit the band, and then you get the Bob Welch era, which is cool, not great. Then you get the the Rumors era with you know Stevie Nicks, the uh, Stevie Nicks and um, Hey sweetie, just checking on the cat. Um, Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham, couldn't think of the name. So I like that stuff uh, up to a point. Um, once you get to after Tusk, ne not the same for me. But sticking to Peter Green, that era of Fleetwood Mac is my favorite just fabulous and so he leaves never the same lou graham a foreigner and this is change in direction and leaving so those first four foreigner albums are spectacular um especially the first three i when i was younger four was my favorite now looking back the first three are my favorite compared to four but those first four then you get to agent agent provocateur and you get the, the, I want to know what love is, ugh. And then later on you get, say you will, say you will. Ugh, no, I'm out, I'm out. And then Kelly Hansen, no, I'm sorry. The only, my only love of foreigner is the first four. After that, 
I'm out. All right, the next could be kind of considered a duo, but let's just talk about Steve Hackett for a minute. Steve Hackett, let's face it, was always pretty much held back by the rest of the band. And essentially, um, something happens and Steve Hackett's on his way out during the um, Seconds Out tour. And the last album he's on, of course, is Wind and Wuthering. There's a falling off there. Again, perhaps he's not, um, his whole heart's not in it. I love Blood on the Rooftops, that acoustic piece, right? And, 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 and um, Phil Collins' voice is amazing. You have some nice stuff with Steve once he joins the band. So, but there's just not enough guitar. Tony Banks overpowers him, just, just. And of course you wanna count this a duo. Up to a point, um, Phil Collins does a great job replacing uh, Peter Gabriel. Trick of the Tail uh, picked off right where um, Genesis left off, if you consider the album before um, the double, right? Um, the lamb lies down on the lamb lie down the lamb lie lies down on Broadway, which is fabulous. I love that. But if you look at everything that Peter Gabriel did, starting with uh, well, if you look at everything Genesis did, starting with Trespass through and including Trick of the Tail, for some, and as good as the lamb is, it doesn't fit with the the overall sound of those albums. Um, but P Peter leaves, and like I said, Phil Collins picks up right where he left off, and even Peter Gabriel himself said uh, something along the lines that Phil Collins sings like me, but even better, or something like that. I don't know if he's being humble or false false humility, but regardless, he's right. Um, well, he's not right. Well, I love Peter Gabriel's voice more than Phil Collins, but what I meant to say was that he's partially right, because Phil Collins does a wonderful job in stepping into Peter Gabriel's shoes, so that's what I meant. So. Steve Hackett, for me, was my favorite member of the, of the band, and I love what he's doing now solo with his band. Um, and of course, eventually Phil Collins, um, with the band, takes a new direction to get way too commercial, so we miss Gabriel at this point, right? All right, so Steve Walsh of Kansas, along a, du a duo with Carrie Livgren. Steve Walsh leaves, Belafonte comes in and does a great job, not as great as Phil Collins, replacing Peter Gabriel, but close enough. And I like those two albums with him, Vinyl Confessions and um, Extreme Measures, I believe. It's got the big bassoon on the cover, right? Um, Steve, there's, there's no voice like Steve Walsh. He's not my favorite vocalist, but he's definitely in my top 30. I did a video on that way, way back when I first started this channel. Steve Walsh sounds like nobody else. Carrie Livgren moves on because he wants to do more religious themed music. And we can hear that on um, certain songs like Dust in the Wind and stuff on vinyl confessions like Diamonds and Pearls and that kind of thing. Um, so this is really a pair. But of the two, Steve Walsh and Carrie Livgren, I, I miss Steve Walsh more. It's just that voice, right? Even I, I hate to admit this, but I, I'm a big fan of the song All I Wanted on the Power album. It's a power ballad. Um, I confess. Guilty as charged. Uh, charged. Now, having said that, there's something to be said about Carrie Livgren um, taking the charge when during that phase when Steve Walsh uh, was having writer's block. All right, moving on, Neil Sean. And what I mean by Neil Sean is Santana. He comes in for Santana 3, and then he's out after that. He goes on the forum journey with Greg Raleigh. Um, I love Caravan Sarai, but boy, what could have been, right? All right, next is Eddie Vedder. I love that first Pro Jam album. And I love part of the second album, but after that, so this is a change in direction type of thing with respect to Pro Jam. I never really liked Pro Jam after Vitology. Uh, there's a couple songs on that I like. I certainly don't like Spin Spin to Black Circle. So goofy. All right, next is Getty Lee. And Getty Lee, of course, doesn't leave Rush, but like Eddie Van Halen, like Brian Matros, he's a gearhead. And because of that, I'm still not finished reading his biography. I slowed down because as I got into the post Grace Under Pressure stuff is where I'm starting to go. Oh, some of the things that Getty is saying, I just totally disagree with it. His direction and love of, of the gear that he's using and just, and of course, Neil was all aboard with the drum kit and electronic drums, and I don't mind that so much, but poor Alex, and, and so many of us have talked about if only Alex would have stood his ground, uh, who, what could have been right? You would have had more heavy, 
hard rock and prog stuff perhaps. Um, and even Alex eventually caves and starts using um, effects, and he has to because the effects pedals he was using wouldn't have gone with the music that um, is being composed. So Getty Lee for being a gearhead, and I love Getty Lee, it's just that I, don't, I, I disagreed and still to this day disagree um, and still are heartbroken by his change in direction. They get some of that mojo back towards the end with um, part of the last album, Clockwork Angels, partly some of it I don't like. The album before that, Snakes and Arrows, and I love, I just love, um, sorry, um, got the fireball in the cover, right? Anyway, uh, sorry about that, uh, brain bubble, right? So. Uh, vapor Trails, thank you. Uh, all right, so Getty Lee, changing direction. Next is Ronnie Van Zant of Leonard Skinner, The Plane Crash, boy, and, and losing, his, so this is the duo again, him and Steve Gaines, and, and Steve Gaines' sister, right? And, you know, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, you know, I'm young, I hear this on the news, I'm like, oh, right? And just, so what could have been had Ronnie and Steve and his sister and, and everyone else who died be with us now um, on their way to Baton Rouge, right? Just so sad. So again, there's no disrespect here. It's just my love of Leonard Skinner. Um, get goosebumps talking about it and I can hear church bells now. Um, so just again, gut-wrenching, heartbreaking that um, these individuals left us so soon. And again, I know I'm repeating myself, but what could have been had they lived on? All right, next is Dwayne Allman, another heartbreak. Never the same after his passing. You get uh, Dickie Betts kind of takes over the reins for a while and you got some okay songs. Lord, I was born a rambling man. And then you get the, reun you get the reunion or you get a comeback period. Um, with some really good stuff, but it's still not as good with Dwayne. So I like some of that later stuff. You have songs like Desdemona and oh, and some live stuff, but it, again, never the same. Uh, bon Scott. I love Black Back in Black, and I love some of the stuff post that, uh, but pretty much everything after either Flick of the Switch or I'm Fly on the Wall, I don't care much for. I like. I like um, Thunderstruck later on, but it's just, Bon Scott was the glue. That was that chemistry, that was the odd. Ozzy was to Black Sabbath what Bon Scott was to ACDC. Next is Alice Cooper. And what I mean by Alice Cooper is him going solo because I loved his bandmates. Now, do I like the Alice Co Cooper solo stuff? Absolutely, do I like everything? No, but it was never the same. That heaviness, um, there's some heavy, well, I misspoke. There's some heavy stuff in the solo, but there's that ing those some ingredients are missing, right? Anyway, all right. Did I leave anyone out? I sure didn't. At least not to my notes here. Anyway, post in the comment section if you think I missed anybody or someone you disagree with. Anyway, have a great day. Take care now. Bye.